Become a part of the Horton team. We're looking for welders, painters, assemblers, machine operators, cabinet makers, and other positions to build emergency vehicles that help save lives. Join us at our hiring event on Wednesday, January 18th from 2 to 5 p.m. at 3800 McDowell Road in Grove City. We offer a huge $1,500 sign-on bonus and great benefits such as 401k match, medical coverage starting day one, and much more. For more information on what Horton can do for you, visit careers.revgroup.com and search Grove City. 92% of households that start the year with Peloton are still active a year later. 92% because of a bike? Not just bikes. We also make treadmills and rowers. Oh, let me guess, for elite athletes only, right? Nope. It doesn't matter if you're an avid exerciser or new to working out. Peloton can help you achieve your fitness goals. 92% stick with it. So can you. Try Peloton bikes, tread or row, risk-free with a 30-day home trial. New members only. Not available in remote locations. See additional terms at onepeloton.com slash home dash trial. Under cold Midwest skies... Something lurks through the dark. From the rolling hills to the flatlands, they move through the fields. They are cryptids of the corn. And we're back, guys. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. So, because of Christmas this week, we're going to launch this episode today-ish, if I get time, or maybe tomorrow, just because we're not going to have time later in the week. Today's the 21st of December. Is it? I think so. Well, Jay knows more than me. It's kind of been a blur. Uh, last week, we've been in with Emily's family uh, for Christmas, mm-hmm. last four days. Then uh, we had a... Death in the family, so we gotta go up to Cleveland uh, tomorrow. So it's just like a lot of running around. All right, so I'll tell you the topic of today's episode. All right, what are we getting into? South Bay Bessie. Mm, old Bessie. Bessie. So Bessie is basically Lake Erie's equivalent of Loch Ness, kind of. There's a little bit of difference uh, in uh, appearance and stuff, and we'll get into that. First, we gotta do the front of house stuff, like always. <clears throat> clear my throat if you hear anything new justin has a new mic that's very nice that my uh father-in-law and mother-in-law got me for christmas with the stand and everything so it's very nice it's high quality um we are doing great with the podcast yeah uh we're at so far and it's a little funky with we use anchor uh to launch our stuff so there's some lag with how many listens we actually have, mm. but it says we're up to 512. Which is awesome. 10 countries. All right. Yeah, so we're at 10 countries. Uh, I know, let me pull it up so I don't say anything wrong. International Cryptids of the Corn. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I'll read you the 10. What, now the U.S.? Yep. Ireland is 10% of our listeners, so thank you, Ireland, for listening. If you guys have anything, you know, you want to, us to cover, maybe, or I'd be interested. You guys got corn over there, so I'd be interested in uh, doing one of your cryptids. If you have it for us, you know, find us on Facebook or the email and give us something to talk about. Italy, Sweden, United Kingdom, Denmark, Australia, Canada, Brazil, and Germany. All right. Did I get to 10 there? Yep. Okay. So we want to thank all you guys for that. That's that's amazing. That's a lot farther than I thought we'd be halfway through our first season. Right. Uh, and once again, I'll put the email and everything in the links to all this stuff. If you have something you want us to cover, or you're interested in being on the show, or you're interested in recording your little sighting or whatever, you know, if you don't want to come and talk to us physically, or not, you don't have to come and talk to us, especially if you're in another country, but if you don't want to talk to us live, uh, record it and send it to us, and we'll kind of listen, and we'll talk about it. Um, I don't know how to do that yet, but I will figure it out as yeah. soon as somebody wants me to. Absolutely. Uh, I'm lazy to necessity. Um, but we want to thank you guys. It really is. It's going amazing. Heck yeah, it is. Um, so we do have a planned Bigfoot expedition for mid-April. 
uh, in Manistee National Forest, Michigan. And they just had a sighting a couple weeks ago, uh, which is pretty cool. And then we're going to go up in January. That's, couple, yeah. that's second weekend of January. A couple weeks from now. From we're going to be up there ice fishing and spear fishing. But we're going to go around and plant some flyers and stuff like that to help. If you have, if anybody has an active report or a recent report, just kind of help narrow down our search. Because Manistee National was gigantic. Yeah, we'll get our feelers out. Mm-hmm. And hopefully we turn you know turn up with something. or. And then we are going to build some uh, of the Bigfoot bait traps. Basically, they're just PVC and peanut butter. But uh, to help kind of get some prints and stuff like that. So, it is Christmas, and we broke the, uh, remember when I said we were going to buy something for 200 Oh, yeah, we broke, that was by that. Yeah, it was an episode ago. Yeah. Oh, so we couldn't record last week, so last week was a pre-recorded episode. Right. So, just so everybody knows that we didn't have, whatever we said wasn't, you know, we didn't know it was recorded two weeks ago. Uh, I got artwork lined up. I got this thing of a kayaker and a Bigfoot behind me. I'm going to get a hold of that guy. And you get some other cool ones. Oh, okay, okay. Um, what are we going to do with that? For the giveaway. Okay, the Christmas we'll, giveaway. Yeah, I don't think it'll be a Christmas giveaway. Because it's Christmas this week. Well, yeah. And I got to still buy the thing and everything. It's so in the Christmas we will, spirit. So we will be doing a giveaway soon. And, yeah. Uh, so we are signed up vendors for the uh, Salt Fork Bigfoot Conference. Okay. And we're going to do a giveaway there, too. Basically, that's going to work. I'm not going to tell you what we're going to give away. It's a surprise. But, uh, we're going to, what's it going to say? Basically, you're going to show us you're subscribed to us on some platform, and we'll put you in for a drawing. Simple enough. Mm Mm-hmm. It'll be something good. All right. So, once again, Merry Christmas, or whatever holiday you celebrate. Yeah, we I am personally a Christian, so I celebrate Christmas. Yep, same here. So, it's just, you know, it's what we celebrate. You want to tell me Happy Hanukkah or something? I'd appreciate it. Emily's cousins are Jewish. Oh, okay. So, uh, it is what I celebrate, so that's what I say. All right. South Bay Bessie. Ohio's Loch Ness Monster. Except she's kind of got a curious streak and maybe a mean streak. Oh, okay. And there's some money on her head. And this is in Lake Erie? Yep, this is South Bay Lake Erie. So for anybody that's not an Ohioan, uh, South Bay is the western side, basically the whole western side of Lake Erie. Lake Erie is part of the Great Lake chain. Uh, I think, I don't know how big, I think Lake Erie is number three in surface area. Mm. Don't hold me to that. But it's huge. It's, a, yeah. it's, it's an ocean. It's an inland sea. And it's a uh, walleye capital of the world, ain't Walleye it? capital of the world. A quarter of the world's walleye population live in that lake. And it's delicious. They're amazing. They're I just, great. I just had some last night. Did you? Yep. I got cod in the freezer. Refrigerator oh. thawing. Oh, nice. I had some walleye cheeks. Ooh, yeah, you can't... That's called walleye wings if anybody's not an Ohioan. So they have little... You got a... It's a decent size walleye. You got little chunks of meat in their cheeks. And it's delicious. It is. It's like melt in your mouth. Yep. But, uh... Yeah. So, South Bay is like, uh, it's Canada, Michigan, and Ohio. Okay. Um, yeah, that's just what it is. It's the, so we have the Bass Islands and Kelly's Island. Uh, they're big islands, there's towns on them and stuff like that. But they're out there. Put in Bay. Mm hmm. All right. Description. Uh, she has been reported approximately 30 to 60 feet, depending on who you talk to. Uh, there are a bunch of them are like in the 16 foot range. Um, described as a uh, very snake like and dark colored, it has a dog like head, large fins, and pointed tail. So, what that dog like head means, as far as I could find, is not the ears and stuff like that. That very triangular shape to the head. Snout looking yeah. face, okay. Uh, you know, kind of like seals have that and stuff like yeah, that, you know. Yeah. That's what, as far as I could tell, because I'm like, dog like head. It, but that's, as far as I can tell, that's what they mean. Okay. Uh, most sightings of Bessie are just that, sightings. Uh, she's believed not to be aggressive. But there have been a couple attacks. Uh, they usually occur, we feel they usually occur when she feels like her territory is being encroached on. Or, young is present. Mm. 
Um, the Western Basin Lake area is where most of the stuff occurs. Like Bessie's Young? Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Uh, every, I won't spoil it, but there's, I think there's been three Bessie attacks. I have the history here. Alright, so this is a lot of reading for Justin, so everybody at home, I'm sorry. <laughs> but this is the history part, so I think it's important to get names and everything right. Yeah, I agree. Uh, cause you don't, that's how you hurt somebody's feelings. All right, so we're going to go back to 1793. Holy moly. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, these sightings are really... The first groups of sightings are really kind of short and lacking information. Uh, this is mostly due to logs being destroyed. I think they only keep ship logs for like 20 years after the ship's in service, most of the time. So a lot that, of these records have just been destroyed. Right. So they have little bit pieces of this kind of stuff. Um, like I said, uh, first one, 1793, the captain of a sloop, that's a type of ship, named Felicity, uh, startled a large creature described as more than a rod in length. That's 16 and a half feet. And that's it. That's it for the first sighting. Um, oh. so about, you know, we're going to say 17 feet. Yeah. More than 17 feet. He just seen, I... It, that's all speculation. A ch I'm assuming he's seen a chunk of the thing take off. And uh, the second sighting, there was three in this year, but it's 1817. So uh, a little bit of jump in time. 20 years. Yeah. Wait, is that 20 years? It's roughly. Whatever. Yeah, 20 years. No, I can't math. That's what was 27 first? years. Okay, it's somewhere in there. I can't math. I didn't ever claim to be a mathematician. All right. Uh, the first of these sets were made by a crew of a schooner, another type of ship, mm -hmm. reported to see a serpent. They reported it being dark in color in between 30 and 40 feet in length. Um, and that's it for that one. So does it have like a snake-like body? With that's feet? what most people describe. Sometimes there's feet, sometimes there's not. We'll get to that. I have a whole bunch of okay. things. I got them all the way up to like two years ago. Um, the second occurred later in that year. A boat crew sighted a similar animal, saying it was 60 feet in length and copper colored. Uh, they shot the creature with muskets, but with no visible effect to the creature. Mm. I don't think they hit the thing. Right, yeah. I think, they, I think they'd know. The third event occurred near Toledo. Uh, two French brothers named... You want to try to say that one? Oh, Dissot? Dusso. Dusso. Yes, we'll go Dusso. All right. There's no O in it, but okay. Well, that's that's how you pronounce the E A U. Is that in really French? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Well, that'd make a lot more sense. Yeah. Uh, encountered a huge monster that had beached itself. Uh, they claimed it was writhing, uh, as if it was in its death throes. The creature is twenty to thirty feet long, and shaped like a large sturgeon. There are sturgeon in the lake. We'll get to that. Except this creature appeared to have little arms. Hmm. So, it's very different than a lot of the other sightings. The brothers fled the scene in fear. They later returned and found the creature had vanished. They assumed it was carried off by the waves after its death. Only marks were visible where they were or had been laying, is all that was left behind, and some large scales the size of a silver dollar piece. Hmm, okay. So, I'm going to take a little pause. So, she said sturgeon, or they said sturgeon, not she, he. Uh, sturgeon don't have scales. Oh, okay. Well, uh, I didn't know that. They have scoots, and then skin like catfish. Oh, okay. Uh, scoots are giant armor plates. Yeah. So a sturgeon that's 20 foot long, those plates would be about a foot and a half long. So they're not they're not scales. Oh, okay. So a sturgeon don't have scales. Yeah. Just so... But whatever, whatever this thing was, did. Had scales. This thing... This, this sighting kind of throws some junk in there. Um... All right, so we're going to jump to 1892. When was the last one? I just forgot the last three. Um, 1817. 17, so yeah. we're jumping far. Uh, there was a spectacular sighting that had been seen by an entire crew of a ship. The ship uh, was, was chartered from Buffalo, New York to Toledo, Ohio. The whole crew, including the captain, saw a large area of water approximately a half a mile ahead. The water appeared to be churning and foaming. Like, uh, like something was happening in the water. They reported to see a huge serpent. And they said it seemed like whatever, it seemed like it was fighting something under mm -hmm. the water. So, 
they just seen the one beast and they seen chunks of it and they just could see it. It, it that's all they kept saying is it looked like it was fighting something uh, they estimated the length was 50 feet, and the circumference was 4 feet. Its color was brownish with large fins. And they said it had a ferociously spark, or it was ferociously sparkling. So, it's shiny. Like the uh, were, yeah. were vampires in Twilight. Mm-hmm. So, this sighting was, carry, or was carried by a bunch of local newspapers upon its report. Um, I'm gonna, I got a note here to come back to. No, I think I cover it. Okay. Another, uh, and this one's not too much far of a jump. Three years. Four years. May 5th, 1896. So here is a bunch, I got a bunch of quick short ones. Yeah. Uh, another thing took place in Crystal Beach near Fort Erie. Four witnesses watched a 30-foot creature with a dog-shaped head and a pointed tail churning the water. So again, we see this thing that's, it's either a, like a feeding behavior or a fighting behavior. Or maybe a mating behavior. Mm. We'll get into that later. Uh, this lasted for 45 minutes before it finally disappeared uh, right before nightfall. In 1960, Ken Gallick was pier fishing and he heard two rats. This, I love this story. It's very short, as you can see. It's only a paragraph. So, Ken Gallick was pier fishing when he heard two rats. Picking up some rocks, he threw them at the rats. At this time, a creature just uh, had decided... Or, <laughs> sorry. This time, a creature he described as cigar-shaped came up about one to one and a half feet out of the water. Uh, the event took around 11 p.m. on a clear, calm night. So, for all I can understand in this story, there's two rocks run, or two rats running down this pier. He takes a couple rocks and throws them at these rats, trying to knock them in off the pier. Yeah. And then right behind it, this giant head comes up, just looks at him, and then goes back down and disappears. Hmm. You know, he'd stop drinking after that. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, uh, 1969, so we're getting some recent ones. Jim Schlinder? I can't read if anybody's curious. Schindler. Schindler. Oh, there's a list. Yep. Uh, saw a serpent that came within, uh, six feet of him near South Bass Island. He could not see how long the body was. He did say the width was the creature was close to two feet. The creature seemed to be about a foot underwater, hmm. so just a big, like a t like a big tube. In September, nineteen eighty one, Teresa of Akron saw a snake like reptile that was so large it could easily capsize a boat, and it seemed to be playing. She saw the creature near her house on Cedar Point uh, Causeway. Oh, sweet. Mm hmm. And. Uh, so in 1983, uh, Mary M. Landle told John, uh, how do you say that one? Oh, Sh Schaffner. Schaffner. Uh, about her encounter of Bessie on Rye Beach in Huron. Uh, Mary had gone out of her front porch just before dawn. The lake was placid, but f uh, from the left, she heard a rowing sound. She saw what appeared to be a capsized boat. It was greenish brown in color and about thirty or forty to fifty feet long. She soon realized that there was an animal of some sort. It had a long neck, one visible eye on the side of its head, and a grin going up the side. Ooh. It appeared to be playing, but it still scared her. Hmm. So you got this grin. Yeah, dog face. I, yeah, I don't. I don't care what kind of animal or creature we're talking about. It's a whole another level. When it looks at you and it smiles. Yeah, it's making facial expressions. Like, hey. So I'm going to write something. And a lot of these stories they are describing, at least they're pretty similar. Similar creatures, you know, along thin. Yeah, there's a, there's a couple that stick out. Yeah. But not much. And we get that uh, with animal reports in general. Uh, people are... People are remarkable at just picking out a key character and then filling in the rest of the details. Mm -hmm. So key characteristics. So like the large eye or the shape of the head. And then did it have scales? Did it not? Does it brown? Did it you know what did it have nostrils? Did it have guilt? You know, they mm -hmm. just that their your brain just fills that in for you. Tom Schill of Avon, Ohio was boating with a friend. Oh, sorry, this is in the summer of nineteen eighty five. 
uh, just north of Vermilion, when he saw a serpent-like creature, uh, they said five humps came out of the water. No way it was a sturgeon. It was described as dark brown with a flat tail. Del Manuro of Lorraine was also boating when he saw the creature face to face. Uh, he started or stated it had three humps and was black in color. It was twice the size of his 16-foot boat. The waters were calm just off the Lorraine Coast Guard station, and the sighting lasted three to four hour or three to four minutes. Sorry, not hours. In 19, uh, 1986, there were reports of monster on Monster Tracker from David Monk saying that he spotted the sea serpent. Uh, he said that the creature's eyes were the size of ostrich eggs and were located on the sides of its head. The head was 18 to 24 inches wide. He also said that he couldn't uh, see the or see a nose or a mouth. It was black skin and smooth as a killer whale. Hmm, okay. So going back to uh, Tom Schill's, I have, so that's the Black River he's talking about. That's where the Black River dumps into Lake Erie. I have sampled fish there, mm-hmm. a bunch. And... It's big. It's 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 people that don't know. It's like looking at the ocean. So you're in a river that dumps into the ocean. But yeah, there's a lot from that area. And I don't know what it is about like Lorraine slash Avon. It's weird. Hmm. Um May or June of nineteen eighty six or eighteen eighty nine. Oh my gosh. I'm sorry people. I'm not a good uh reader, like looking at a paper reading. It's a lot better when I know the story fully. This one has a lot of sightings. So it's just in my mind, it's important to get the dates and the names right. Right. Because people take great offense. All right. Any questions so far before I go on? Oh, no. I, they're all pretty fun stories. Um, it's, it's nice to hear a lot of different variety of stories. Yeah, not to say it adds to its credibility, but... Gives you the idea that something really is lurking around in the lake up there. Mm-hmm. So far, no, nothing scary yet, right? Right, yeah. No, just nothing spotting scary. something in the water. Yeah, I'll tell you what. At the end of this, I'll tell you guys my sea monster story. Did I ever tell you, Jay? Um, I seen a sea monster. No, uh, no. The government media got involved. No. Oh wow! Hang in for this one, folks. <laughs> Yeah, I thought I was going to prison, or I was going to be disappeared. Shoot, maybe you... you oh, nah. he's trying to remember. I, I I do recall you about something like that, but that, I thought that was maybe the UFO thing when you said that. Nope. See, this is the problem when you work at a bar. Yeah. You kind of forget a lot of the stories you goes. hear. You hear a lot of stories from a lot of people. All right, so I'm going to continue on. We don't have any questions or comments yet. Um, Gail... Cancer. I'm going to. I'm going to go with that. In uh, June of 1989, obtained a graph from a boat owner, Ken Smith. Nice easy name. <laughs> you can read that one. Uh, the the fish finder shows the sonar reading of a cigar shaped object about 35 feet long and a depth of about 30 feet. Hmm. So he had like a little picture. Oh, we had a photo of it. Uh, it's sonar graph. Oh, oh, gotcha. Okay. In July 8, 1990. Season season of Salem witnessed a creature two miles in the Salem, Ohio. Just so everybody knows, not Salem, Mass. Right, yeah. Uh, witnessed a creature about, or witnessed the creature two miles from Cedar Point. She gave a description that matched the other reports from the past. Two months later, Bob Soriaco was jet skiing off Port Clinton when he thought he saw a porpoise. But after he looked again, he realized there was no porpoise. He gave a description saying it was very long, and moved, and as he moved closer, it was going down. He stated that it had humps with gray spots. The next day, Harold Bricker and his family were fishing north of Cedar Point Amusement Park when a serpent-like creature swam a thousand feet away from their boat. He described it as 35 feet long with a snake-like head. The creature was moving fast, uh, as moving as fast as their boat. Later, they reported their encounter to the ODNR at East Harbor State Park. A week later, fire inspectors Jim Johnson and Steve Dirks of Huron saw the creature from a a third-story window that faced the lake. 
They stated the creature was dark blue or black, was 35 to 40 feet long. He further stated the three parts of the creature were above water. It laid motionlessly, motionlessly for three to six minutes um, and was flat on top. So we're almost through the story. I only got one more page. Uh, September 16th, 1991. Dan, okay, or Dennis. Say that last name. Oh, okay. Isn't that a fun one? It's Polish. I, 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 I understand even, it's Polish. I can't even attempt that one. Uh, who puts an S and a Z right next to each other? Szynski? Okay. I, don't, I don't know. Something like that. Dennis uh, S. I'm very sorry. We'll just call him Dennis Esky. I'm not even going to pronounce it because I don't want to offend. But it's Dennis S. of Toledo. Saw a creature near Toledo's water intake structure three miles offshore of Mommy Bay. He reported he was uh, he was fishing in the bay when something long and black slithered in front of him. Uh, July 2nd, 2004, so we just had a big jump. And then we'll come back to 2001 here in a second. But July 2nd, 2004, there was a sighting at Madison Township Park in Lake County, Ohio. The water was described as calm. Um, and at sunset on the lake, a shape emerged from the water. Then resubmerged. The creature was reported to be moving fast. Uh, this, it surfaced again and moved to the left at the same speed. It claimed to have uh, they claimed it to have humps and was thirty to forty feet long. A boat approached it and it re, uh, resubmerged and disappeared. Mm. All right, two thousand one monster attack. Oh, okay. So this is a kill forty eight people. Wait, really? No. Oh, I was. I think I should have heard about that one. Yeah, I think uh, I think we'd know yeah. the story a little better. All right, uh, there was a. This is where the reports of aquatic attacks began on August two thousand one. The attacks were savage in nature and occurred mostly around the Pump House Beach near Port Dover, Ontario. Uh, in a time span of twenty four hours, that's it. In twenty four hours, three people were bitten by a large unforeseen animal. Mm. 24 hours, that's all, that's fast. Right, yeah. Uh, the first was, uh... Especially three separate bites. Yeah. Uh, Mr. McCormick, uh, slipped into the water from a, or uh, for a sunset swim when he felt a large bite on the side of his right calf. He frankly swam to shore and found six-inch series of circular puncture wounds embedded into his calf. The wounds were jaw-shaped in nature. Uh, that morning, a man and his son were also assaulted in the same location. Mm. They swiftly swam to shore and rushed to the nearest hospital. The child required hospitalization for his injuries. Uh, Port Dove and neighboring communities began to theorize that it could have been uh, what could have caused attacks. Some believe it was a school of piranhas. Mm. It was not a large circular bite. No. Uh, some blamed a juvenile Bessie. And others thought it was could be a also a eel like cryptid known as Cressy, which is most uh, mostly spotted in Newfoundland Crescent Lake. Uh, nothing solid has been reported yet. They're the same creature. Cressy. Yeah, it's the same thing. They're exactly the same description. There is still a reward of a hundred thousand dollars being offered for uh, by Huron uh, Lagoon uh, Huron Lagoon Marinas to capture Bessie alive and unharmed. Hmm. So that's a secret. Mm hmm. Fine print. That's how they get you. Man, if, if I were trying to catch that thing, I would probably get me a big, uh, you know. Don't uh, don't spoil nothing. <laughs> people, better people than Jay have tried. <laughs> <laughs> Throwing a lot of their money at it. All right. So that's, before we go to break, that's the, uh, the sightings. Any of them stick out to you, really? Uh huh. I like the one with the guy with the rats. I like that visual. I just that that's vis- my favorite one. <laughs> yeah, that visual of just like you can see him just sitting there drinking and just some, hey, like throwing messing with the rats. I've on, been on that pier too. Seeing that head pop up. Yeah, that's funny. There's some unscrupulous people, and that's who I picture. Yeah, one of these like guys, <laughs> and also there's just sea serpents. Like, what you doing? <laughs> it goes like down. Oh man, yeah, that's funny. Um. But yeah, the bites, the uh, jaw structure, uh, we'll get into this. We'll come back to the bites. But uh, it's not piranhas, and it might not be a Bessie. 
Um, there's a very known culprit in Lake Erie that likes to bite and can be fatal. Ooh, should I know this? I feel like I should know yeah, this. Yeah, you should know this. You got one on the wall. I, here? No. Oh, okay. I do know this. Yeah. Do, like, do they bite people, though? They've killed people in Canada. Hmm. And we're talking about musky. Yeah, the musklunge. Uh, musky musklunge. But we'll get into that after the break. Hmm. Anything else before break? Well, I was going to ask, uh, how deep is, do you know how deep Lake Erie is? Um, I know most of the lake, I'm trying to remember, I don't know this off the top of my head, but I think the deepest is only like 60 feet, 70 feet. And I think like the But whole, most of the lake is 25 to 30 feet deep. And in the whole like western side of Lake Erie, for the most part, not even like that deep? Yeah, I'm going to say it's 20. Yeah, it's, okay. All right. Uh, yeah, Lake Erie is a, it's... Lake Gary is the most biological productive place on the planet. Oh, I didn't know that at all. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. It has more biomass than the... Uh, it has more biomass per square square meter than the Pacific Ocean. Okay, that's insane, yeah. The Pacific Ocean's like a desert, though. Oh. We just say it because people think it's big. Oh, yeah. Because it is big. It people is. People attribute that to abundancy of life. Yeah. Uh, no. It's really a lot of it's like desert... Oh. All right, we'll be back. All right, we're back, kids. Welcome back. So, Jay, any more comments about the history before we move on? Um, I mean, it has a pretty vast history. It, it's pretty chunky. Yeah, pretty uh, lengthy history. Yeah, a lot a of small stuff. Yeah. But pretty chunky. But it's... She's never not been seen... In the last 300 years. Yeah, exactly. It's just going to say we're 17, 1800s, 1900s, 2000s. Yeah. So, four centuries. Yeah. She's had sightings in. And uh, I'm sure uh, she's had sightings before that, I'm sure. Right. I don't. I didn't dive into the, the Native American legends on this one, but I know there's a lot with, like, Ogo Pogo and stuff like that, which is other lake monsters in the Canadian U.S. area. Mm, okay. Um, so... I, as a young lad, decided Bessie was going to get caught by Justin. <laughs> so I bought uh, a great white shark hook. Or I bought two of them. I bought a pack. Uh, they're using the Catch Great White Sharks for biological research. They're not cheap. This hook was like 17 inches long, had a 9.5 inch gap. Uh, the gap is the length between the, the shaft and the, the shank of the hook. Mm. Uh, and was half inch thick can't remember what it was. It was something steel. It was some kind of steel. You couldn't bend it. We picked the four-wheeler up with it in the garage to make sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we did. We hooked it to a ratchet strap, picked the four-wheeler up off the ground with it. It didn't bend at all? Mm-mm. And um, we bought 200 feet of half-inch steel cable and attached that to both of them so each of them had 100 feet of cable. Uh, I acquired eel pheromones because we'll get into natural explanations. You'll know... Where I lean pretty heavy. Um, and a uh, couple raw chickens. So basically, how do I say this? We went to a spot in Lake Erie that had sightings that we could attach this hook to. There you go. And we attached the hook to it. And uh, we put in the eel pheromones. And we didn't catch anything. I'm going to spoil that right now for you. But the, the <laughs> yeah, it just, it was a whole bust. I hooked a big rock and I never got any of that stuff back. Well, at least it was fun trying though, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, we had a ball. We had a ball. Something beeped and I'm trying to figure out what beeped. Hopefully, hopefully it might have been this. It might have been the. Uh... You think it was you? Yeah. Okay, sorry guys. When something beeps, we got to try to figure it out. Yeah, I think it was just me. Okay. Because um, I have all this technology, and I don't know what any of it does. <laughs> um, so, big hook, chicken, eel pheromones, nothing. Nothing at all. So, we're going to get some natural explanations. Um, oh, actually, before that, let me go back to the bite marks on the kids. And the, the two men and the kid. Oh, yeah, attacked. yeah. Um, very round, six inches gap is a, and 
the the teeth were large puncture wounds. Um, it really sounds like a musky bite, a really big musky. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, but muskies bite people. A muskies actually a musky killed a lady in uh, Canada in the nineties. Hmm. It sliced her artery. Oh yeah, that so one. muskies Get bite people kind of often, and I've, I've seen I've seen muskies teeth, and you know they're oh they'll shred you, and they're pretty big. They're living blenders. Yeah, they're just uh, it's basically butcher's knives, and they got some weight behind them, and they're going kind of fast. They'll slam India, mm-hmm. but um, powerful fish. Yeah, they're powerful fish, and it's all in the same area around structure, and that's where you're gonna you know it's around a giant pump house. That's where you're gonna muskie fish, anyways. Uh, muskies will bite, especially if you're wearing jewelry or something shiny or mm-hmm. something. They're just, they'll bite. So I kind of chalk that one up as a hungry musky. I think it was a little larger. I think if it was a, a Bessie creature, we'd have a little bit more of a nasty bite. Yeah. I don't think, I don't think they're dangerous. I just think if they were to bite you, it would be a lot less pretty. You wouldn't be going for stitches. Right. I mean, you're talking about the smallest one that we've seen so far is about 16 feet. I was just say, yep, exactly that. Not five foot. Yeah. A it big muskie is like five, maybe six foot. It'd probably add your whole leg in its mouth or something. Yeah, or its I mean, whole mouth wrapped around If it wanted like, to bite you, it'd bite you. Yeah. And that would be that. Um, so we're going to talk about a couple of natural explanations. I'm going to talk about a creature called a blesmosaur. A what? A mosaur? A blesmosaur. Okay. Uh, they're not dinosaurs, even though it has Saurus in the name. They were originally discovered and thought they were giant snakes. Uh, but they're actually prehistoric whales. So Blesmosaur oh. was very crocodilian in appearance. Big triangle-shaped head. Mm-hmm. Uh, they still had four flippers, not just the two they have today. And they did have a long snake-like tail with a little fluke on the end. A fluke is a tail fin without bones in it, if anybody's curious. Oh. So like whales, the end fin, the tail fin... It's actually called a fluke. Oh, like the two parts yeah. that come off the side? They're called flukes. Gotcha, okay. Uh, they don't have any bones in them. Didn't know that. Because mm-hmm. they're just tail. They're, they're hard cartilage on the end of a tail. Oh, it's cartilage? Yeah. Okay, so it's not like meat or something. Uh, yeah, there's meat there and stuff. I mean, there's a lot of stuff there, but it's no no, no bone. No bone, no. Okay. Because it's the end of their spine. Mm, okay. Uh, once again, you turn into cryptids of corn, you will get some kind of biological lesson. I promise you. Especially, mostly pertaining to fish, probably. Whales are not fish. Come on, they're big fish that live in the water. No, they're actually big, like hyenas. Oh, <laughs> that's a little bit different. Yeah, yeah. It came from a little carnivore. It was like hyena shaped. <laughs> Anyways, I digress. So these blazemosaurs, some of them got 70 feet long. Uh, they were very reptilian looking, even though they were mammals. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were. Some of these were really high-end carnivores. Uh, they were very different than modern whales. Uh, they were not filter feeders, they, and they, they were very high end aggressive predators. And when they swam, they had more of an undulating motion uh, than a side to side. So they would appear to have humps. Okay. Um, the, the big problem with this theory is, as far as we know, they've been extinct for a while. Blesmosaurs were not deep divers, like they're modern day whales. Uh, so they were, they were pretty locked in at the surface level. So that's hard. That's harder than let's say some deep sea animals. They, I believe, there's some. I believe in a lot of sea monsters, but blesmosaurs to be around would be very hard because they they can't. They're not escaping. They're not spending nine years of their time right, in deep sea yeah. waters. Like they they have to be at the surface and to be in a freshwater body and not get caught. It's only thirty foot deep, and you gotta come up to breathe every five minutes. Yeah, that would be tough. You're gonna get seen a lot more than this thing's been seen a lot, but you're gonna get seen a lot more. But I just gotta throw that out there. People put uh, blesmosaurs out for all kinds of stuff. Uh, it is an option. It is. I mean, there there's a lot of description that fit. Uh, especially, like... A lot of overlap. The, st- the, the sturgeon eel with little legs. Yeah. Because they still had fingers. Some of them did. So, I mean, you can never count anything out that it might just slip through the cracks. Still yeah, be out there. Just, for it being in the freshwater environments, I just it's hard for me to believe... For me, it has to be a non-air breather. Because if you're spending all that time at the surface, you're going to get caught. Right. In a freshwater environment. Right, yeah. Because it's just, it's not enough space. Yeah. It's just, you're going to get seen. Especially Lake Erie has how many hundreds of thousands of fishermen on it. All day. day. Yeah. Oh, uh, so. Unless it, they just know 
to not come up during the day. They just know if they that'd can hold be, their breath. If they can hold their breath for 12 hours, yeah. that'd be very impressive. Maybe they got their spots. Who knows? There, there's all kinds. I just don't feel like that's a viable option. Yeah. The other one is giant eels. This is what they are. Yeah. 100% fact. Uh, uh, but no, that's what I lean towards. Right, yeah. Um, people like me ask, well, how big is a giant eel? I'm glad you asked, Jay. Yeah. <laughs> so the biggest eel we have today is a conger eel. And they're kind of special. Uh, their cousins are in Loch Ness. Uh, I don't think a conger's ever been found. Congers are a saltwater species, but they do like estuaries. Mm. And sterile adults have been known to go into uh, fresh water to hang out. Mm. Uh, so this is kind of argued a lot about the world record conger. Uh, there's a one picture floating around of a 16-footer that is uh, 300-something pounds. So that's about an 8-inch wide eel. Yeah. Uh, not small. Uh, the one I went with was the one I had the most confirmation with. It's 10 foot long and 140 pounds. So uh, big fish or a big uh, eel. Yeah, they get big. They get big. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Uh, that one won by weight. They do get 10 feet. Not often, but they do get 10 feet. Yeah. If that makes any sense to people at home. Um, they're mostly a European and a Canadian species. Uh, they like cold water. Um, so some people ask, like, why Loch Ness and, like, why don't they have on sonar? Well, conger eels and all eels will actually dig a hole in the mud and back in and just have their head out. So if you're going to assume, let's assume that she's an eel, they carry just mud on the bottom. Yeah, it is. You're just going to hide there until you got to feed, and that's what they do. Hmm. Um, and as far as the figure eights go, with a couple of stories, the churning water... Um, I said figure eights. I kind of let out. Uh, eels will grab a chunk of food and they'll twist their body into figure eights to break it off. They don't have a chewing mechanism. Oh, gotcha. So it looks like they're trying or fighting something when it's, it's not there. They're just tearing something yeah. up. And I, I encourage you guys to go look up YouTube eel figure eight. Yeah, it's, it's, sometimes it's violent and there's nothing, they're not fighting anything. They're just chewing and, basically. Yeah. And they're just, it, but it looks, it looks violent. Hmm. It looks like they're fighting a ghost. Yeah. <laughs> um, fighting a ghost. So I'm going to tell oh. you guys, well, I guess I kind of have a, a little backwards on here. What are you going to tell us? Going through my little paperwork. I guess I'll just follow my paperwork in line. Sorry, you guys don't like the sound of rustling paperwork. Uh, I think we're going to start doing it as PowerPoint. Ah, okay. So I have little visuals, and then I'll upload the PowerPoints oh, on the cool. Facebook page. Yeah. So you guys can go through them, too. Uh, you can fact-check me and whatnot a little easier. Uh, we're, I'm not perfect. We're all for fact-checking. I mean, yeah. I mean, if I get something wrong, I would like to be corrected. Yeah, definitely. Uh, nicely. We're all about please truth don't, here. Yeah, don't, please don't scream at me. I'm one man... But I will, I will correct any information as long as you're not, like, cussing at me about it. Like, <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about eel larvas. Um, so there was a giant baby eel. They're called glass eels. Uh, but most larval eels are around three inches long, and most of their adults range about 12 feet. Okay. Almost all, so all true eels, so let me just talk about that for a second. Electric eels aren't eels. Knife eels aren't eels. There's a lot of eels that have eel in the name that aren't true eels. So this next hmm. little bit of information, the next couple paragraphs I'm going to go over, are just about true eels. Pertaining only to true eels. Yes. So just because you know something like a fire trek eel, that's not a real eel. It's got eel in the name, I get it. It's not a real eel. Um... So yeah, so almost so almost every species of true eel follows the same ratio, and I don't want to get in the math about it, but basically three inches equals a, a 12 foot adult, maximum size. In 1930, a research vessel named the Dana caught a, I hate this word, the boat, it's larval eel. I can put it on Facebook for you guys, it's a big scientific word, it means larval eel, or glass eel. 
Uh, this specimen measured six foot in the length. This is the larva? Yeah, the larva. If it followed the same ratio as everybody else in its family, it'd be over 100 foot long. That's a big eel. Mm-hmm. So, what do, the, uh, what do the scientists do? They just talk about, okay, this is the freak of nature. This is the only eel that doesn't follow this rule. Which there are, in other families, there are examples of that. Nobody follows every rule in any family. Mm-hmm. I mean, look at the platypus for the mammals. Right, yeah. Uh, the egg layers. Um, I don't think it breaks any rules. I think it just is a part of this giant species. And people... Let's talk about eel reproduction. We know nothing. Nothing. Don't then you? I think you told me that. Oh, like, get into stuff. Okay. We we don't know this for a fact, because we've never ever witnessed an eel breed. Oh, okay. Gotcha. We've only know where eels go pregnant and baby eels come back from. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's it. That's what I was going to mention. Uh, so over the past centuries, the consensus has formed an American and Europe species of eels. So this is all America, all Europe, and even Russia. Or not Russia. Australia? Yeah, no, Russia counts, but uh, Africa. Oh, okay. The Pacific eels have a whole different thing. Um, they all go, so all these species on three or four continents mm-hmm. to touch the Atlantic, all go to the place called the Sargasso Sea. The Sargasso Sea is in the Bermuda Triangle. Bum, bum, bum. Mm. Yeah, no, it gets weirder. Um... We only we just know it's so weird. We know all eels. So our European eels and American eels can interbreed and sometimes and stuff like that. We just know pregnant eels. So it's weird to think about. It's hard to explain to people that aren't fish people. These eels, American eels, mm-hmm. that make it all the way up to Chicago, from the Mississippi. Yeah. Breed in the Bermudas. Hmm. All these ones that are in West Virginia, that come all the way up the Ohio. Breed in the Bermudas. Bermudas. So even the, in Europe, yeah, in Europe, in Africa, yeah, uh, they all go to the Sargasso Sea to breed. So this is how a giant eel species could be spread out over so many continents, uh, because eels already do that. Right, they are. It's not. It's not a question. Spread already. Uh, and once again, like we've never witnessed eel breeding. They are probably the most mysterious species, a uh, group, whole group on the planet. Uh, even mores mm-hmm. do this breed there. Hmm. It's so weird. It's really, it's truly odd. Uh, we know nothing about the Sargasso Sea. It's a very hard sea to dive in. Uh, it's uh, it's kind of like a turning part. Uh, yeah, it's like the drain. No water don't go nowhere. But it's like a turning spot. So it's extremely hard to dive. Yeah. It's normally very cloudy. Uh, all we know is we know pregnant eels go there and baby eels come back. You, you would like to know what's going on, though. It's so weird. They're so secretive. Yeah. Um, Someone needs to strap a gro- GoPro to an eel. And... and eels will actually make eel bridges to climb up over dams and stuff like that at night. What's that? What, what's an eel bridge? So they'll use each other's bodies to make, like, a rope ladder to and get they'll over climb it. each other. Yeah. yeah, and then they'll pull up the back. Wow. Eels. Um, Has that ever been, like, oh, uh, what's the word of, documented or, like... Yeah. Recorded? Yeah, so in Europe, uh, they used to think eels spawned from either night crawlers hmm. or rain mm-hmm. uh, for a long time. Because every time it rained, all your buckets and stuff, all your water buckets would have eels in them. I didn't know how. And so what eels will do is eels will sniff out where new water is. Yeah. And they'll wait for a rainstorm so they don't, they don't dry out. And then they'll all climb up on land and go out. Oh, There's wow. actually uh, long fin eels in New Zealand actually eat stuff on land. Though they've been known to eat birds and stuff off the land. Huh. Yeah. So eels are crazy. I love eels. Actually, is my eel book? I have a whole. I have a book about that thick. On eels. Just eels. With no ending. I'm not. I'm not shocked. I mean, what's over there? There's stuff about invertebrates, freshwater invertebrates of the U.S. I'm sure it's lurking in there somewhere. Yeah, but it's probably my other collection. <laughs> uh, Elvers is another name for baby eel. I know adults have ever been caught uh, in the Sargasso Sea. We only know there's babies there. Um, I talked about the figure eights. So now, any questions about that, Jay? Mm-hmm. Um, no, I'm I'm definitely intrigued though by uh, eels all breeding in the same or spawning in the same mm-hmm. area. That's mind blowing. It's very odd, and it's uh, what we think it goes back to is like the super subcontinent. 
they were all spawning in a lake. Mm. And as it, the continent spread, they never changed the spot they bred in. Just that spot. And they right just there. got better at swimming. Mm. Well, yeah, yeah, that would definitely uh, add to I think them. the one, some of are swimming like eight or 9,000 miles to get there. That's ridiculous. So they'll come in, they only breed once in their life. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, so they'll come, like, the ones in West Virginia might live in West Virginia for eight to ten years and then go out and breed. Huh. And then when she's going, she'll release, uh, most time males, so females are the ones that come really far inland, males stay around the coast. Mm-hmm. Uh, like Arkansas, for example, there's a lot of male eels. You get a lot of eels that are about a foot long instead of these six-foot American eels. Yeah. But uh, she'll really experiment the whole time, and she'll take a whole colony out there with her of males. Oh, okay. I wonder if uh, that one, that giant larva, the six-foot larva, is the, the eel from uh, Super Mario 64. Could be. I do remember which eel you're talking about. Yeah. I think it could be Bessie. Um, so we're going to talk about the Kelly's Island monster hoax. I'll tell you right now it's a hoax. I left it out of the, the oh. history. Because it is a hoax. Uh, in 1912, the monster had become a source of local, like a local practical joke. The Daily Register article uh, published in the spring of that year uh, recounts of uh, encounters between the Kelly's Island residents and a large sea monster that broke through the sheet of ice and uh, headed towards shore. One described a black object with a huge head and a gaping mouth and hundreds of teeth slammed its head through the ice. And started charging the island. And uh, the article read, the article's uh, last line read, April 1st, at its date of publication. Mm. Uh, at, at, at other times, newspapers were receiving the, or were at the receiving end of the hoax. Uh, so, that's the, so that's the Kelly's Island hoax. It got kind of famous because Kelly's Island was like, they, uh, this giant black, like a salamander is almost what they describe it. A giant black yeah. salamander broke through the ice and started charging the island with just all these teeth. Yeah, these vicious teeth. They actually went out there and broke a hole and made these giant monster f- footprints. Yeah, all for April Fool's joke. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're on an island that's surrounded by ice. You're going to do something, I guess. Yeah. Um, like I said, uh, other, other times newspapers have been at the receiving end of these hoax. Uh, July 22nd. Uh, 30, 1931. Sorry, there's a weird dot there. Um, Sandusky was all a go Tuesday night because it was reported that a sea serpent uh, supposed to be in the waters of Sandusky Bay had been captured. Uh-oh. Uh, the New York Times reporter, who had happened to be visiting in the area... Oh, the, the day, convenient. Uh, that, uh, the day the, or the story got picked up nationally. As the story portray, uh, portrayed it, Two vacationing men from Cincinnati saw a sea serpent while on the boat at Lake Erie. The two frightened men clubbed the animal into submission, brought it aboard, and placed it in a crate. So they had told everybody they caught this thing. Yeah. They beat it, and they got it in a box. Yeah. Uh, Harold Madison, uh, curator of the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, journeyed to Sandusky. Because he's like, okay, uh, I gotta see this. Uh, and pronounced a sea serpent to be an Indian python. The two men quickly, quickly left town for the investigation revealed that the men, one of whom was the family ties in Sandusky, worked for a touring carnival. Uh, so he brought the python from yeah. the carnival, mm-hmm. and they beat it to death. They were trying to make a name for themselves as monster catchers. Yep. Um, credit goes to occult-world.com. I got a lot of this from them. Uh, they were they, had, they got the story together pretty good. Mm, okay. All right. Yeah, what a, that's a pretty good scam, though. And here's a map for Jay. What's this? What's this map? Eel migration. Oh, okay. There's a Sar... How do you say it? Sargasso? Sargasso. Sargasso. Oh, uh, I've heard it pronounced a couple different ways. Yeah. So I gotta try to keep this mic in my face. Because I'm a hooligan. Huh. Yeah, it's a pretty wide uh, range. But it's crazy. They all go there. They all... They all float down here. Yeah. Hmm. I didn't know that Bermuda was that far out. I thought that was like right on the no. that uh, Dominican Republic Islands or whatever you call that down there. Nope. It's so, on the Bermuda Island. Well, yeah. See, I don't even know where that is for sure. It's a, it's in Bermuda. Well, I know that I can... It's that land. You think that name would give it away? Never been there. No, oh, it's right by Bermuda. Oh, okay. Uh, it's right there in the ocean. What are you talking about? Right, yeah. 
It's in the... I always thought it was, like, down here. No, it's way out there. But, yeah, it's up there, yeah. Yeah, uh, the Bermuda Triangle. The Bermuda Triangle starts in Florida. Uh, it's, like, right there. And goes way out here. We'll have to get into that sometime, too. But we, uh, we have it narrowed down to this... This part of the ocean. Yeah, that's crazy. that's only five thousand miles wide. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, it's, that's seriously from the that's like from us to California yeah, wide. I was just gonna we, say we know they breed in there. Yeah, it's like saying deer breed in the U.S. They do. I mean, all right, Jay, you've been quiet. Let's hear your thoughts on this story. Well, um, I think something, I think something is there. Okay, like what? What do you think? Well. I know you think it's a giant eel. I don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> but you know I wouldn't. I wouldn't rule out w- even that dinosaur use or not dinosaur, oh my but gosh. but they call him a sore, fish. This fish saurus, Belizemosaur, Belizemosaur, something like that. With yeah, the they small thought it was legs. a reptile when they it first could, discovered it. So. It could even be a could some sort of salamander, giant salamander, something. Now that's one that I could get behind too, with the little legs and the yeah. head. Especially with the so head. There's a lot of similar species that don't have to come up for air at all. Huh. Uh, hellbenders get three and a half foot, and they actually breathe their skin. Oh, okay. See? I mean, I could see something like that, but I, I definitely think there's something. I don't think this is all a hoax or anything. No. No, it's definitely not. I think I have a book that the uh, Loch Ness Giant Salamander Theory. Uh, not here, but I got one in my other part of the collection. Ah. So I, see, I mean... But you can't. I just can't rule anything out. Um, I do think it's real, as to what it is. It could even be something more mythical than, you know, like, you don't know how these things move in and out of dimensions. Like just like Bigfoot, you, you never seen a water. Never really consider that for water creatures and stuff. But there's a say there's not a portal under Lake Erie or something that, it's finding its way to and from. Hmm. Good thoughts. Good thoughts. Never I don't know. know. Uh, nobody knows. Never know. Nobody knows. Unless you unless you got a giant treble hook with some raw chicken on it and you hook a, one. No, just a normal hook. No okay. treble. Oh, sorry. Shark don't want to kill it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> treble hooks are a little rough on animals. Unless you snag it on there and you pull it in. Yeah. You're not gonna know for sure. Pulling that bad boy in. <laughs> but you tried. Um, yep. Yeah, what, f- what do you think? My thoughts are pretty evident. Uh, giant eel theory is what I've always bought into. That's how I think we have all these sea serpent legends and lake monsters and stuff that fit almost the same description from all around the world. Yeah. Is it have to be a pretty universal species? Uh, eels kind of fit that very well. I mean, and they we talked how they travel worldwide, I mean, yeah. basically. So, and eels get that big. Well, not thirty or forty foot. The eels get sixteen foot. Yeah. Uh, we have some prehistoric species of eels that got a lot bigger, and so it's just, it's already there, to me. It's just there's just a lack in fossil record, and they're hard. They're hard to catch. Mm-hmm. I've done eel surveys, and not found eels. Hmm. I was paid to go out and look for eels for five days. And you never found any. Never found any. They're elusive creatures. They are. They are. They are. They're secretive. Yeah. Uh. They're not, like, they're predatory, but not to the extent of, like, um, like, they're not hunting very often. They're more scavengers, and they're darn good at it. Yeah. They have some of the best noses uh, sent for, for scent. They, they're just, they're good. Uh, there's American eels at the bottom of the Pacific, or the Atlantic Ocean. Hmm. That are freshwater eels. Oh, okay. So, it's just, it's hard to think about that, that maybe we're just spending a very short part of their life cycle in fresh water. Right, yeah. Mm, to come and go in. Mm-hmm. And that's like, that's how Loch Ness can look the same as Ocopogo. And they're 17,000 miles apart. Yeah. Well, that, that makes, that checks a lot of boxes. I just think uh, a lot of the continents, too, are the, they're seen, there's a lot in Africa. There's a lot of these giant serpents in Africa. The salamander theory doesn't fit. Salamanders are not found tropical. There's very, very few species. That mm. are found around the world tropical. They they just struggle. Mm-hmm. Their body plan's not good for it. They have trouble breathing. Uh, and then aquatic salamanders too. They need cool water. Right. Yeah. Not too much of that in mm-hmm. Africa. I can only imagine. But yeah, it's just. I mean, they're seen everywhere from Antarctica. I mean, there's reports of sea serpents around Antarctica. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay. And so there, there's nowhere on the planet 
that these giant snake-like creatures aren't seen. Any eel activity down there in Antarctica? Yeah, there's tons of eels. Okay. Well, I think it's one of the biggest fish under the ice sheet besides the Green or Iceland sharks, or Greenland sharks. I don't, I don't know they're in Antarctica. There are sharks under the ice in Antarctica. I don't know what species. Okay. Oh, that'd be interesting. I'd like to know that. I bet you would. Yep. <laughs> but yeah. So anything else about Bessie? I I believe it's real. I don't know if there's any. I think if there's any left, there's very few and far in between. Agreed with evolution. that. Yep, I agree with that. Um, and I think we're seeing that about everywhere in, everywhere in the world when we talk about sea serpents. There seems to be a great withdrawal. And some people think, it matters It matters if you're a believer or not, some people think that's cultural, mm-hmm. that we're getting further away from our own fairy tales. Yeah, I agree with that. And then some people think it's just because there's literally less of them. Right, it's just a natural reality. Mm-hmm. There's less of them. It's like if deer were going extinct, you would see less deer. Right. Because yeah. there's less deer. Hmm. Makes you, makes you wonder, though. It makes you wonder. That's why I like this stuff, this subject of cryptids in general. It just gets, it gets your mind wondering what's really out there, what is real, what isn't. Mm-hmm. I think next time we do something like this, I'm going to cut the uh, the history up a little bit. That was uh, over half the episode, just me reading. Oh, that's okay. That's half the fun, though. Okay. It's, I think it's, I think so. We'll it's put true. it up to you guys. Do you want the full history tale like that, or you want me just to do the highlights? And then we just give our opinions. Like... I guess. Because we're I mean, at an hour right now. Right, yeah. I like the history. I like... Uh, I like the history, too. Don't get me wrong. It's just... I like learning about stuff. what you guys at home want is what we'll do. Oh, uh, yeah. We're on this journey together. That's mm-hmm. right. Um, I think that's it for thoughts. Do you have anything else? I got nothing else to add to that one. All right, everybody. Uh, from around the world, I never thought uh, I'd be a part of an international podcast. <laughs> Same here. Uh, we're on four continents. Oh, that's pretty awesome. Uh, we'll get that elusive Antarctica continent one day. There's like five guys down there, and they can download once every like four days. Yeah, we'll hit it one of these days. The algorithms but, uh, will reach them. But uh, thank you, guys. We do appreciate it. Uh, please, again, like I said, I'll put the email on the Facebook in the description. If you have stories, want to hear t- some kind of story or anything like that, please, please reach out to us. I want to do what you guys want us to do, uh, because I have books and books. I mean, I could literally, I mean, I got this book of uh, Indiana Legends. I can flip through and just poke at one, and we could do that next week. Right. Or, you know, but if there's something you want to hear, I'd rather hit that. Yeah, I'd like to learn about it, too. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. So just thank you. And I'll figure out the giveaway thing. Uh, It's not going to be for Christmas, because it's just, we're not going to have time. But we are going to give away some artwork. Yeah, I'm excited about that. I like that painting up there. So, mm-hmm. if we get any more like that. I'll go get my map today. Oh, nice. All right. Um, Room's coming together. All right, guys. I think that's it for this episode of Cryptids of the Corn. Uh, we'll catch you next time. But first, we got to do our monster call. Oh, yeah. And I think it's Jay's turn. Yep. So, what am I doing? Uh, South Bay Bessie. Oh, what would South Bay Bessie? What? Oh, has there been any reports of them even making sounds? I'm not telling you. Why would I help you out? I don't know. I can't even think of what a freaking. I just want to. I wish I could make like bubble noises. That's all you'd hear. <laughs> I think it'd be. Matters if it's an eel or a salamander. Well, they don't have. Either of those are on vocal cords. So just yeah. be like. <laughs> Yeah. Just a wet, excrescive air. Yeah. Something like that. <laughs> wet air. I think that's the noise they make. Uh, yeah. That's right. I bet you're going to get on me on that one. All right. Oh, there we go. There you go. So I think soon maybe we'll do our first UFO thing. Oh, okay. Well, we'll see. I may not be next week, and that's all Jay. Jay's going to be the UFO guy. Okay. He yeah. doesn't know that, but I bought him eight UFO books and just handed them to him before this <laughs> yeah. episode. Yeah. And that's kind of the hint. Yeah. <laughs> all right, guys. We'll catch you next week. Merry Christmas, and Merry whatever you celebrate. I've been Jay. I've been Justin, and we are Cryptids of the Corn. <laughs>